This is Geek Gab with your host, John and me, Daddy Warpig. We are back. Geek Gab for us, Saturday, November 3rd, 2018. And uh, we have on the show today uh, a good friend of ours and an author all the way from Israel, Yakov Merkin. But before we get to our illustrious guest, um, John, how was your week? Hello. It's been a good week. Just the usual stuff, working, gaming. Really excited to be on, on the Geek Gab today. How about you, man? You're playing uh, Terraforming Mars again? Uh, as usual, is is my now my customary weekend activity. Does it replace Gloomhaven? Not at all. Uh, I, uh, I fit in Terraforming Mars around my Gloomhaven schedule. Okay, let me ask you a question. Because uh, we talked about Gloomhaven first a couple of months ago about the persistent nature of the game and how things changed and new characters became available and stuff like that. Now that you've played it for an extended period of time, uh, what would you say about uh, how the game sets that up? Uh, in, from, what, uh, from what perspective? From your perspective as a player. I, I will say that uh, the game itself, the persistent nature of the game, gives you a lot of replay value. Um, the there are bad parts to it. The writing is, you know, is it's it's not even it's about as good as your average crappy video game RPG. Uh, the story's not particularly interesting, but uh, the game itself is fun. And the fact that you're always, you know, one or two games away from unlocking a new set of equipment or uh, earning some new treasure or even unlocking a new character class. All the character classes are locked away until you uh, retire one character, and that usually unlocks the next one. All that generates a great... Uh, you just want to keep coming back to it. Now, when we first talked about Gloomhaven, uh, we also talked about superheroes. Uh, and I mentioned that if you stole the six classes from uh, Interlock, it's the Interlock system, right? Or uh, Fusion. Fusion. The fusion system. You stole the six superhero character classes from the fusion. You have a speedster. You have a um, gadget hero. You have a you know, magician. You have a brick, so on and so forth. Um, that you could actually make a game based on the Gloomhaven mechanics, but with superheroes and supervillains instead of fantasy tropes. I, I, I said that that could be possible. Yeah. Um, do, do you think that's still possible looking at how Gloomhaven plays? Uh, I do. I do. As far as the individual game goes, if, if you took your superhero tropes, your, your main superhero archetypes, and you, you could build a game around that and have it play almost the same, and, and it would be a lot of fun. Uh, I'm not sure about the, there's a couple of, there's like a gear aspect to it, collecting gold, that sort of thing. I'm not sure... I'm not sure you'd, you'd have to create some sort of analog for that because um, it doesn't matter if your superhero gets a, a brand new set of chain mail, right? <laughs> you'd have to tweak the setting to, to fit it. But I, I think so. Uh, as far as would it be better as a superhero game? I'm not so sure about that anymore. Uh, it may not be as, as satisfying if, if you just had a modern day Gloomhaven thing. I'd love to test it out. Um. I think it's just spitballing off the top of my head. If instead of gear, you got uh, new powers or new, uh, they used to call them stunts in the Marvel, um, in the old phase rip Marvel game, you used to have stunts. Like, so Hulk is super strong. He picks things up, he throws things, he bashes through walls. But he has a stunt where he can use his two hands and pound it on the ground, and this ground wave travels in a straight line to where his enemies are and knocks him over. Um, and so you could, instead of using uh, equipment in a superhero game, replace it with stunts. In a, in a Gloomhaven game, all those stunts would be represented as, as different uh, ability cards that you could earn as you level up. Oh, so they already have thought of that. Yeah, um, that's why it would convert to superhero games so well. Interesting. 
Okay, well, obviously I haven't played Gloomhaven. I haven't even read the box or, you know, know nothing about the game except what you've uh, said on the show. So I will cease to opine about uh, adapting mechanics I have no knowledge of. Uh, yeah. Excited. <laughs> Go ahead. I'm excited. I, I'm glad you're enjoying the game. Um, oh, you asked about my week. My week has been exactly the same. Um, I work a lot. I do a lot of research. I do a lot of development. Uh, we talked about some new mechanics I pulled up with before the show, which I'm excited. Uh, the future point when the game is in a state to where we can, uh, where I can share it, I'm excited to show people those mechanics. I think they're, um, I think they're really good. I'm excited, but uh, nothing yet. Nothing else public yet. <laughs> okay. So, well, um, good to so, know. Did we have a guest? Was there a guest on the show? Am I wrong about that? Yeah, Possibly. Tim, welcome to the show. Apparently, you don't play Gloomhaven. You need to play Gloomhaven, by the way. <laughs> yeah, in, in, in what spare time am I going to play any games? But <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I, your background is known on Twitter and stuff. Do you mind if we talk about it on the show? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, Jakob Merkin is uh, an author, part of the Pulp Revolution. Uh, he's He's pub pub published uh, four books now, one of them that hasn't shown up on Amazon, uh, three of them that have. Uh, the links to his Amazon profile uh, is in the description of the video, of course. He's got a new book out. called uh, It's the third book in his Galaxy Ascendant series, and a link to the Indiegogo campaign for that is in the description of the video. But first, but first, before we talk about the Indiegogo campaign, before we talk about Henry Cavill's beard... Um, <laughs> Uh, Yakov is a soldier in the Israeli Defense Forces and uh, does his writing in and around his duties as a soldier and indeed is, is broadcasting to the show uh, in and around his duties as a, as a soldier. Although it's way, way, it's like midnight out there, isn't it? Or later? No, it's only, it's only, only 8 p.m. right now. I mean, I'm only home for the weekend. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I'm home for the weekend also, so it's even better. Very nice. Um, so, uh, you know, you, you send out pictures of. I believe John De La Rose's uh, steampunk series uh, in front of a big old tank. I thought that was yes. awesome. <laughs> I've made that into a little bit of a theme. I've done it with a few other books in the last uh, few months. I decided we have a tank. It's not anything hidden or anything. It's like an old America by one. So it's decommissioned and just on the base. It's like a monument because I'm on a, I'm an armored core base. So that just sits there and nobody cares what, we, what I do around there. So I can take a picture on it, put a book on it. Do whatever. Yeah. When I was a little kid, I grew up in the military. I grew up on a military base in Germany. Uh, I spent eight years living on a base. Um, and they had an APC and a uh, World War II era uh, Sherman tank that were on base as exactly what you're talking about. They're decommissioned. They don't work. They don't drive or anything. But they were there for... Um, you know, as museum pieces, they were on display outside of buildings and stuff. But uh, you could crawl in them as a little kid. You could crawl up inside uh, them and sit on the chairs and, and things like that. And I did that a lot. That was fun. That's cool. I don't think this one is climbing, is able to be climbed in or anything. I haven't tried, but I don't think it works. We do have real, we have real APCs on the base, but they're, they're Vietnam era M113s that we, for some reason, still use. Oh yeah, uh, I had to help fuel them up a few weeks ago, and that was uh, a bit of a messy experience. They're they're basically like this box, just this square box with yeah. treads. <laughs> pretty much. I mean, they have a bit of some new tech added and stuff like that, so they could still be used. But they're they're pretty much a punchline in the army here. Like we're working. I think they already are at least one or two replacements that will be replacing them for real at some point in the next, I don't know, probably decade or two. So but for now, we have. To. Does the Israeli army? Do you still use uh, Bradley fighting vehicles? Uh, not that I know of. I know like the only AP like those kind of vehicles we have. We have uh, the Nunmer, which is like a new a new upgraded APC that has more firepower than the old ones have, and they're developing. They think it's already been developed. Uh, another one called the Aton. It's a new meant to be like a fighting vehicle um, with much like designed to have more firepower on it. But that's not, I think it's going to service another year or two or something like that. It's almost in service, but it's not quite yet. That one's like a, it's a wheeled fighting vehicle as opposed to a tread-based uh, one. So let's bring this back to the main subject of the show. Um, yes. 
Does Here. does being in the military, uh, I, I'm sure that has uh, lent you added credibility when you're talking about, um, you know, gear and war gear and, and maybe even combat scenes. Is that the case? Uh, a little bit. I think it means the advice being in the environment helps. Like, my biggest criticism of The Last Jedi, among many, was how the, the purple-haired admiral was completely a terrible, terrible military commander. Like, my... 19-year-old female instructors that I had in my basic training would have done a better job in command of that fleet than she did. <laughs> so, like, it was complete, like, I can't imagine, I guess it must be that nobody who made that movie ever was involved in the military ever or has any friends who ever were and just, like, they either knew nothing and just didn't care to learn anything or I don't, I don't know what happened. I mean, there's a lot of questions about what happened with that movie. But it's been done to death at this point. What 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 happened? The writers used to research and learn about the things that they wrote about, so that so that even if yeah. even if it was fiction, it was credible. What happened to that? You know, even just working hard to make it to try and fake it. You, you could fake a lot of these things and make it sound plausible, even if you don't know what you're talking about. But they just somehow didn't even try it. That I really don't know what happened with that. I mean, Star Wars is always kind of a bit of a wonky thing with militaries and everything. It's a little bit weird. In general, but like that was something like a completely new level of incompetence. Now, um, before we, uh, what did you do with Henry Cavill's beard, man? I made a tweet. I think I think I think it was on the Netflix tweet about the teaser or a little preview clip of him drinking a potion that they revealed, and all I said was that he would look better with a beard because he looks kind of like way too like. Like soft right now, he doesn't look like an intimidating character in the slightest. So I was like, "You look better with a beard." And then a few hours later, I had and like two thousand notifications later, uh, I, I I don't know, I don't know what happened. <laughs> like there's multiple tweets, like two hundred likes and everything. It was something completely crazy. And see, I caught the edge of that because I sent out the original tweet and yeah. or retweeted the original tweet, whatever it was, and then you replied to me. And so I got all the people who were arguing with you or mad at you. It meant people <laughs> was were weird. angry. I got all of them in my notifications, too. And I was just yeah. watching it going, wow, that, that really got some people steamed. Like, like, no, he does not have a beard in the books. People were yeah, and after the and after the first like twenty minutes, I didn't even talk anymore because everybody else fighting in the comments of my own tweet. <laughs> the next two hours, <laughs> it, it it did remind me of something though, because somebody else was mentioning, yeah, he has a headband in the books, and I'm like, that would look so he he would end up looking like Willie Nelson. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I that's the only person I can think of that has yeah. long flowing gray hair with a headband. It's Willie Nelson. I mean. Uh, I don't know, probably someone involved in the Grateful Dead at that point at some point, but it did. It brings me back to books, um, which is that a lot of things that authors stick in their books are great for books, but they look awful on That's screen. Cool. Like, um, talk about George R. R. Martin's Game of Thrones, the yeah. dwarf character, right? He's yeah. supposed to have his nose entirely chopped off. So his face is really, it's like red skull, right? Yeah. And that would completely destroy the credibility of the character because he could not be urbane. He could not be suave. He could not be persuasive. There's no way someone would keep him around as a, as a counselor or a character, I mean, you know, someone to get advice from. None of them would have done that if, if that's the way he looked. And it would be obvious in the TV show because people would find that look so repulsive. Um, and then the whole headband thing just kind of looked goofy um, in, in the sense of a, you know, big, bold adventurer with two <laughs> swords on his back. And it makes me wonder what... Uh, um, if that's and I don't know, I'm not. I haven't reached a conclusion. I've just started thinking along these lines. Is is that something authors should pay attention to? I don't know. I feel like, I mean, whenever it gets a book gets translated over to another medium, whether it's TV or film or anything else, is going to be changes. Like, there's no way around some level of changes for the adaptation. It's different, different way of seeing the story. So, like, but as far as like 
and then these little details I think are the least important things that authors should worry about when their stories get adapted to anything because that is that doesn't affect like most of the time it doesn't affect the quality of the story or anything like that it's the other changes that they're making with the witcher and other stuff like that that's problematic um so obviously that's not something you write uh think about when you write your books and i'm not suggesting that yeah. people should i just it just is amusing it's an idle musing as i'm considering things um but your book is your book series is called galaxy extended and yes. um the third book is in Indiegogo right now, uh, and I'm going to, I have tweeted out about it, um, and then I am, because um, I, I, I don't want to say this, uh, I may have to double check this, I believe I backed the Indiegogo Yeah, I, I believe you did, yeah, I think I got a notification. Okay. <laughs> I, I was about to say that, and I'm like, oh, but what if I didn't? What if I said I did, because I thought I did, but I didn't. Oh, I can't. No, no, I did. I backed the Indiegogo campaign uh, and I tweeted it out on Twitter. So uh, I'm hoping people will see that in, in back. Um, but and the link to, again, the link to do that to back the Indiegogo is in the description underneath the video. But before we get there, um, what is it that uh, tell us about the Galaxy Summit series? Because we had you on the show um, with the first book. Yeah, yeah, it was when, over over a year ago now. Back when uh, Brian was with us, and you guys talked a lot about uh, the characters and alien races and stuff like that. It was a great show. Um, and But everybody listening now might not know about it. So go ahead and, and introduce the series to people. Yeah, I mean, it's basically a grand scope epic space opera that I've always enjoyed growing up on things like like even like Star Wars, like even Star Trek technically qualifies as a space opera in several of its iterations. Um, games like Mass Effect that I also spent many years playing stories that have heroic characters, grand scope in the galaxy where it's not just earth plus or earth and a few other things where it's, I mean, in my, my own story, there's no humans at all. It's an entirely alien galaxy with an entirely alien cast and the glossary that's now 12,000 words long of various planets and species There's over a dozen species now at this point. Um, it's probably a bit of a crazy undertaking for one person to do in uh, some respects because, like I said, the glossary is that long without any characters in the glossary. Anything, no proper names. There's over 100, maybe 130 already named characters in the series. I mean, most of them obviously are side characters, but still, it's like it's a very big thing. And it's especially now, I was talking about on Twitter just a, a little while ago how all of these big space opera uh, franchises that inspired me growing up are basically dead now. Like Star Wars is, you know how bad it is right now. Star Trek is on nostalgia life support, either grasping at, at straws for Discovery season two to keep it alive. And Mass Effect is completely dead as a franchise. Starcraft also, Blizzard just ignores Starcraft. It doesn't even exist anymore for that. I don't even know what they're doing with it at all. And so a lot of this, I mean, I started off writing this series as like a love letter to the stuff that I grew up enjoying and, and watching. But now it's kind of like, in my mind, it's almost like a replacement or something to fill in the, the void that's being left by all these franchises that are collapsing or just just drop dead. Why not make your own? Yeah. No, I also start like Star Wars now gives me a whole list of a whole list of things to not do. So now I have a whole list of things to make mistakes to make sure I don't make the same mistakes. So in that in that respect, Star Wars is actually a little bit helpful even now, but not in the way they expect. <laughs> don't sell it to Disney. That's my advice. Well, they offer it. Depend, depend, depend how much they offer. I don't know at this right now. But uh, I, I, I admit, I, if oh. Disney offered me four billion dollars for something, I would have to sell it and then just deal with whatever backlash came. You could see that. Yeah, I mean, yeah. in the face. That's exactly what happened. He was like, "This is this was my baby, but I'm done with it now, and I'm really sad, but I have so much money." Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's different. I guess it's different. To, it's a different situation for him versus somebody like me. I he Lucas is already a billionaire at that point, so he didn't have to do it. But if I was offered that much money, I'd probably just, just say, "Okay, fine, and just go with it." But uh, I mean, I wouldn't necessarily be happy about it. But I don't know. It's an interesting question to wonder about. Um, I, uh, so when you were, 
building the galaxy, what made you decide not to use humans at all? A uh, large part of it was just all the sci-fi that I grew up that I enjoyed. My favorite characters were always the non-human characters. Like I never like humans were always the most boring ones out of the party, like in Mass Effect or uh, even in Star Trek. I mean, you had Spock, who was a main character, but he was like very much like like a secondary character. I mean, Deep Space Nine did it a little bit better, where they had more aliens involved. But I was just always more interested. And I feel like if you're gonna write space opera, if you're gonna write that kind of sci-fi. You might as well do interesting stuff, different stuff, and have aliens as characters. I, I guess I understand why for like TV shows and movies, they usually do more humans because it's easier on the budget for uh, effects and everything. But books, there's no limits on what you could create. There's no special effects budget for uh, for words or anything. And cover artists, cover artists can do whatever they want. My cover artist has done a great job with so far four, soon to be six of the main characters in the books on the cover. None of whom are human, some closer than others, but all I have to do is tell him what to do, and he's done a very good job uh, with bringing them all to life so far. I love the idea of, of getting non-humans, but I do have to give you a little crap. Uh, you, I see your icon there on, on the cover of the first book. You know that you have cat people, right? Yes, I do. Uh, that's pretty nice, but aren't you worried that that's a little too familiar? I mean, they're not human, but... I don't know. It's a matter I mean... I guess in some ways, but I mean, I haven't seen that many cat people in science fiction. And I mean, a lot of alien species throughout a lot of franchises were always based off of uh, animals or things like that. Well, let, so, me, let me ask it a different way then. Um, yeah. Am I the only person to, to point that out? Is, is everybody satisfied with the, with the alienness of, of your cat people? I think so. I haven't heard any complaints yet. Uh, All right. Then it's I just mean, me. I, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, well, I mean, they're probably different from most cat people that have been in fiction before, I would think. I haven't, I haven't run into that many different versions of such a, such a species, but I do think that I have, like, the, I guess from a culture perspective, from how they how they do things, I think they are different. Uh, like, they're, they're not anime cat girls, if right. that's what anyone's worried about. And they're, and they're not Khajiit either. No. <laughs> I haven't I've, I've never actually even, I mean, I know about it, but I haven't ever actually played any of the Elder Scrolls games, so... It'd be very difficult for that everybody to influence me too much. Everybody says that they're very good games, but they're lying. <laughs> Even um, if they weren't, I have no time anyway. So, <laughs> Wing Commander, the Wing Commander series, their main enemy um, was space going, the Kilrathi, right? The space going cat people. Oh, yeah. And then in uh, the known space background of Larry Niven, the Kazinti. Uh, were also cat people, and then in Traveler, um, the role-playing game, uh, space role-playing game, they had a, a race called the Aslans, uh, who were lion people. Were they were they all were they all villains or or mixed or? Are you the sci-fi ones? Those are just the three sci-fi ones that came off the top of my head. No, but um, well, but were, were the species all all used in the villain role? Were they? Not all the villain role. I don't the know. And the first thing you said were, but then the other one, the last one, I don't know if it was or not. I, no, I don't know if the last ones were or not. I don't know enough about the official background of Traveler to yeah. make a definitive. Um, uh -huh. And it's possible I got the name of the race wrong. I'm sure somebody. No, I got to write the Aslan. Four limbed, <laughs> upright, bipedal, carnival pouncer, humanoid uh, lions. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. That's all right. All right. Re objection withdrawn. Yeah. <laughs> this is awesome. Yeah. Well, and there are also there are also lots of other species too. Like, as you already see from the covers that I have out, there's as I mean b between all the main characters that I've had throughout the series and will have, there'll be a total of 11, 11 different viewpoint characters throughout the series. Some throughout the whole thing, some not throughout the whole thing, and they represent nine different species out of uh, out of all these eleven characters. So. And there's and there's a whole bunch more that don't even get a main character because there's just too many or some are a little bit too weird to do as a main character at least at this point. So that's the other hard part with non-humans. Also, you have to for main characters they have to be human enough that you can make them a main character. You can't make it like this weird blob that doesn't think like people do at all as a main character at least not for a book. You can do that for like a short story I think, but not for a novel series. Um, so how do you manage a background that, that that's that big? Uh, I somehow manage. I mean, I, I have the glossary that I've been 
building on my own. I put it in the books too because I add extra details in the glossary that doesn't make it into the books because it would just be too much uh, pointless exposition that doesn't add to anything. So I put it in the glossary so readers who actually are interested to read more can learn more there. And also for me, for future books, all I have to do is go back there and look at all my stuff, see what I have. I also have um, – it's not, I'm not, I haven't updated it so much, but I have what's called like a wiki pad. It's like a program. You can make a personal little wiki thing. We could click, make links that are clickable on it and you can organize things that way. So I have some of that in there and yeah, I don't know. It's just one of the things that just seems to work. Like I have that guy, I always go back to make sure I don't contradict anything. And, but writing down just is what helps the most. But I have, again, the glossary has it all written down. The glossary includes everything that's not, proper nouns we're not we're not not characters because there'd be too many to put in there so it's all the planets all the species uh, a bunch of ship classes a couple of important ships i don't put every ship in there that's named because that'll also be too many but um yeah i don't know it just i I mean i've I've always been good at remembering pointless details from books and stuff anyway so i guess that kind of helps when i'm doing it with my own books that I don't have, I don't like forget these things most of the time. I usually I don't even have I don't refer to it back that often. Only when I'm not sure, I go back, like to figure out remember what a planet was or where a planet was. And also, I have a galaxy map to help with that too. I have getting a new map that I'm gonna hopefully, you know, hopefully we finish soon. That I get to release that to everybody uh, at some point. But so, you, uh, so you've got all this stuff yeah. written down and mapped out and noted so that you can refer back to it. Yeah, yeah. I mean the map. I already had a map for the first part of the, the first section of the galaxy that was in the first few books. And now that this book, book three, uh, galaxy expands in a sense to include a whole other, a whole other uh, quadrant almost that uh, I went, tried to spend a little bit more money to get a more fancy map that could show everything on it. Uh, all the different factions at this point. And obviously in the future books that map will be adjusted as territories change, as factions changed. And, um, yeah, just I mean, I have it again. I have it all just just planned out. I mean, all the books are I, I, I outlined very extensively in advance. I already have the outlines for books four and five finished, and I'm planning. To, I'm writing book four now. I already wrote twenty thousand words last week to book four, so it's moving very very uh, nicely along. I love hearing about that. I because uh, you you do a lot of outlining, and and Brian Meyer does a lot of outlining, and actually most of the people we talk to. Um, I, th- I find that really fascinating. I'm definitely more of a pants type of person. Not that I write. Uh, that's probably why I don't write for a living. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's for me, I mean, for every different people, it works different things. But for me, it's very, very much a uh, better system to outline. I have one book that I wrote without really properly outlining, and that's the one book my editor said needs a lot more work to be revised before we be ready to go anywhere. So that one's t- currently on the back burner while I have um this series going while well, i have the, the dragon hand and the fantasy book that just came out a few weeks ago and i'm going to do two more books in that series before i do anything else aside from galaxy ascendant stuff and but all of these books that i've done that i've i my editor hasn't had too much that he wanted to change with these so far overall um and like those were all outlined extensively my outlines now go to like somewhere in the area of twelve thousand words maybe no, no fifteen thousand words in my newest outlines for that roughly written all by hand uh, while, while on my base also. Like, actually, this book, book three, is the first book that I wrote entirely since I drafted. I started it in February, and in February, and I finished it uh, by June, basically. Wow. It's also, it's, also my, it's also my fastest ever written book, too. So but I don't know what... the power of outlining, or are you just getting yes. good? I mean, I think it just it has gotten quicker every book that I've written overall, but the outline, obviously, I could sit down look at what chapter I'm up to next and just say, okay, I'm going to write a chapter today and then I maybe do, I don't know, an hour or whatever and then have a chapter finish and then I just go on to the next chapter and just go on from there. It's very easy to like compartmentalize to just do one at a time and like doing a chapter a day writes you a book in a couple months. I like, believe 65 chapters will be in book four. So if I write a chapter a day, I'll finish it in two and a half months and then on to the next one already. So what um, what aspects of your books are are, are going to draw people in? Um, like, what is it if you wanted to sell people and say, "Hey, this is what you'll get from reading my books. This is why you should read it." Uh, if anyone likes uh, big, large scale space battles that actually have 
some degree of tactics when I, when I can manage it. Um, I mean, when it's something that's not real, it's hard to figure out what people would do exactly, but it has like space battles that often get into the hundreds, if not thousands of ships at times. Um, obviously there's a lot of alien species, alien characters. There's a lot of very different types of characters that I have now. The first couple of books, almost all the characters involved were in positions of, of high leadership whether it's military or a civilian or both uh, leadership. Whereas starting really in book three, I have more characters that are getting introduced that are main characters who are also like from the smaller side of the galaxy who are just their own individuals doing their own thing that obviously is involved in the plot, but they're, uh, so there's a big, a very big broad variety of types of characters, both in species and personality and also what their backgrounds are and how they, how they address things. And, I mean, it's a big. I mean, the, the plan and my I plan for this series is not just to end it at book seven. My plan is to keep this as a franchise going on for as long as I keep writing for. I have already some ideas written down for future uh, stories set both before and after. It's not going to go into the prequel trap of Star Wars because I know better. But um, I mean, there's plenty of room to do stories that take place before the books, after the books, even during the books. And it's just like it's probably. I mean, it's a huge undertaking. I realized like. And I don't make books easy on myself, either with types of characters that I write or just the scale of what I'm doing. Something that I've realized as I went along, like my first book that I wrote had an emotional character in it for most of the book, which is a lot harder to do in real life to write actually than it is in, in theory. Like it's very, very hard to do in practice uh, because you don't realize until you do that how how much a character's like basic or like very minuscule emotional reactions influence descriptions and everything and how they interact with people when you can't use it anymore all of a sudden it gets very hard to write so again i have no i have a history of making it very hard on myself to to make things to make things work but thank god so far it's worked i mean i don't have that many reviews yet on the series hopefully i'll be more throughout this campaign and have people more reading the books but every review that i've had on so far like so far has been a very positive one everyone seems to enjoy it i have at least a few Super fans, like account on my head, like I, like account on already. People who I know have bought all my books, and have told me that they, they loved all my books so far. And um, also branching out into fantasy, but like with the Gaku Senden books are going to be my main focus for the foreseeable future, just because my first love in like fiction form was um, sci-fi, was space opera, and that's what I want. That's what I what I wanted to write when I first got the idea for these stories back. 15 years ago now is when I first got the basic idea that became the first book. And so this is like a long, long term project that's finally become realized in the last couple of years now. And now just a matter of taking it to another level. Like I said, I adding a whole nother section of the galaxy in it. And I plan to only reveal about 60% of the galaxy in this series. I want to leave with 40% of it unexplored as it were, unexplored by at least the main characters for now so that, uh, there's more exploration to do later on. There's more interesting stuff to bring out there. Some of that stuff's already planned. Some of it's not planned yet. And it's just, uh, I, I just want to go back to like, like the Pope Rev stuff also. Like, like I like heroic characters. I like characters who are, even if they're flawed, they're good people. Like I don't like writing villain viewpoints. And everyone who reads the books will see like all of the viewpoints, even if they're, even if they're somewhat antagonistic at times. Like I do still want to write characters who, who even if they're on the wrong side, as you might see it, aren't evil people. I, obviously, we have real villains. We have evil people in the books, but they're not the ones I want to write through because the characters that I enjoy, the characters that people look up to are the heroic ones who get through it, even when things are tough or when their own nature makes it tough. And uh, there's a lot of that going on in book three, especially book four and book five is when things are going to get even more, uh, even more escalated. So... Is there? I'm just coming out from left field here. Is there an overriding moral or philosophy that drives your story, besides just wanting to your personal quest to recreate the stories that you loved? Uh, what not, what think, drives this universe? What drives this galaxy? Uh, like a, from a philosophical standpoint, I don't know if I have anything like that I have in mind when I'm writing, but like. I mean, I have, a, I, I actually did a talk about this a couple like a year or two ago. Now I have a blog post about it, how, how the fact that I'm a religious Jew, that how that really impacts my creative process and how, 
um, how it really influences how I view my creations and also how it, it helps me view the world now also because I, I can't, I'm not going to get into it here. It was a half an hour talk when I gave it a couple of years ago at my family synagogue before I, I think it was, no, it was after I already moved, but I went back to visit and talking about how like I, I basically place myself as the god of my universe, and um, and like I, I basically view it as that. Like I wait till this plant things along. I mean, I guess I guess you could say it's definitely like I mean I don't consciously make this a theme in the book, but I um, like a very um, like Jewish, even Judeo Christian, you could say also like sense of good, of good and evil, um, and. And what, what kinds of people that I like? I, I mean, I, I think that kind of factors into that fact that I like to write as main characters, good characters. I don't want to write morally great people like in Game of Thrones. Like I've, it was it was a novelty that was fun for a few years, and now I'm past tired of that already in fiction. So, like, I want to have again, even if they're flawed, still have people who are naturally like innately good, and who do the right thing when the time comes, and. Who ultimately, hopefully, would get rewarded for it. Obviously, without not without challenge, not without a lot of challenge in some cases, and some characters. I mean, characters. All my, all my characters don't represent my morals necessarily. There is definitely characters who do things, who have lifestyles that I wouldn't have or wouldn't approve of personally. But for themselves, it works. For it doesn't it doesn't impact them being good people. It doesn't impact what their role in the story is, and. Um, yeah, I don't know. Besides that, again, I don't really like. I'm not, I'm not the kind of author who goes into like a book saying I want to push this agenda necessarily. And obviously, little bits of that come in here and there naturally, just by default, because we're human. But I don't really go into that with the mindset. Again, aside from writing fun, exciting stories with with heroic characters in it, characters who I think who I mean who I would like to meet if they were real people, people who would be fun to talk to. It's like if they were real people. That's fair. Uh, I think that's a, that's a great reaction. I, I love that. That's that's a common thing amongst the the pulp riff folks that we've been talking to, and 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 I think it's great uh, that yeah. everybody everybody's everybody's sick of of the Game of Thrones style of, of fiction, and and we all we just want to go back and have some adventures again. Yeah, and sci-fi especially, it's very very like boring right now. Even in Star Wars, like I, I've joked, but I'm not even I'm not joking about this. Like right now in modern Star Wars. Grand Admiral Thrawn is the most heroic character in Star Wars because he's actually, like in my view, he's actually like a heroic character at this point because he actually does what he what he's doing for the greater good. He's actually doing sacrifices for himself, like his own sacrifices in order in order to benefit the galaxy as he views it. Even if he's wrong, he might be wrong. He might be he might be right, but like compared to to the characters in the in the movies now, like like he he's he's the hero of Star Wars now. Just the state, like the absolute state of things, and it's just like, yeah, I don't, I don't mind him being a great character like that, but it's like that's not what Star Wars was back in the day. Like, I mean, that's, I mean, it's been discussed way too much already at this point. But like, it was a, it was an interesting realization that I had when I was reading the Timothy Zahn books, and he's the only Star Wars author right now who I think still has it and still knows what Star Wars is supposed to be. And so, and so genuinely enjoys it and just doesn't want to push an agenda and he just writes good books. So that's why the only thing Star Wars that I'll buy in the future at all is his are, are his books. I think he has one more planned and then maybe more, hopefully more. But uh, yeah, I definitely recommend the Thrawn books, like the old ones and the new ones. I actually just recently read the Hand of Thrawn duology. That was, I guess, his second uh, series that he wrote for the old uh, canon. It's now Legends, but those are also very, very good books. But like, he somehow kept the character alive throughout this Disney change, and it's pretty much the same character, just different different time uh, timeline or different uh, time of the story, basically. Um, so, what uh, is there anything you do to like get your mind in the right headspace to write uh, that kind of science fiction? Uh, not not at this point. I again, I've, again, I've been doing it long enough now. Like I just, I just sit down with my outline. I see where I'm up to in the book, and then I just go and start writing. Especially, I have a lot of downtime. Like on my base, like I've I literally wrote most of this of this book three, while I've been sitting at my job on base. Because my job is sitting at a desk for eight hours at a time, if not longer, doing almost nothing the whole time. So that's the best thing I could say. Also, like 
the biggest problem I have, I see people have in the army on my base, is like they're all really bored a lot of the time because their jobs, even if they're not, the jobs are more active than mine. They're only working for like a, a amount of hours per week, and the rest of the time they're on base from Sunday to Thursday at least. They're not doing anything, so they're just really bored. They're just like hanging out, they're smoking, they're watching videos. And meanwhile, I'm just writing, and so I have what to do every time. I Dead. Am. You did it. What? <laughs> with science fiction and building uh, an alternate uh, or a bolt on to physics to enable some fantastic things uh, to happen. Um, and there are a lot of things I read about, or I watched a video last week. Again, uh, and I mentioned this channel before, I think last week, Space Doc. They were talking about um, uh, some technological stuff and mentioned gravity plating, um, which shows up in TV shows because it's so much easier uh, especially on a budget, than making a ship that, okay, we're not accelerating anymore, so now everything's in free fall. Um, and designing a ship, you don't have to design it so that everything works in uh, two directions. Like, okay, here's horizontal uh, orientation while we're in a gravity well and everything's pulling down, but when we're under acceleration from the rear of the ship, um, everything is going uh, you know, vertically, and so the tail of the ship becomes down and the cockpit becomes up. And so now we have to consider, okay, how do chairs rotate? Uh, how do control consoles rotate? What uh, do they have built into the ship to allow you to move in horizontal or vertical orientation? And what about you know complex maneuvering when you're flipping around and stuff? Um, there are a lot of things you don't have to do when you just use grab plates that those things may enhance the story or may add some uh, optional coolness to the story. But I have found, thinking about them, that a lot of those things that are technological limitations do not provide a solid background for continuing stories. Primarily, they're things that you'll want to use in one or two situations that are interesting. But if every single time you're in a fight, you have to deal with that, it's going to bore the audience. They they will yeah. to move on to new challenges. They'll want you to move on to new um, events. And so you have to take that into consideration. Am I making a decision that would be great for a short story or maybe great for a standalone novel, but is just not going to work in a continuing series? How do I change that? Um, what kind of process did you go through while you were building your, uh, you know, science fictional technology for your books? I just, I mean, I'm writing space opera, so that's not, like, it wasn't ever a priority for me to, like, like make it realistic, quote-unquote, which, I mean, even realistic sci-fi is, a lot of it's dubious at best anyway. So, I guess, like, same with, like, how Star Wars did it. It's just, like, we need the hyperdrive to get from point A to point B, but not making stories about, like, entire movies about the hyperdrive is a problem. We have to fix it. Like, that's what Star Trek does with the warp drive. So, like, for me, it was just a matter of, I wanted to have this kind of, story this kind of battles i wanted to have big space battles that i don't want to worry about like little like things like that every time i want to have just big ships slugging it out little ships flying around i mean i try to do a little bit more i try to do it i have include a little bit of science stuff in there to a degree like i have like and star i have in star wars they have the ships like they kind of just act like airplanes so i kind of i try to include things like thrust vectoring so they could just change direction much more easily they don't have to bank like planes do in order to in order to change direction in space because they shouldn't have to or i tried to take advantage of the third dimension in space i do definitely in the big battles i tried to make mention of the tactics that involve attacking from above or below because if I, i'm thinking if i was commanding a, a fleet of ships and there's a fleet that i'm fighting over here i would obviously try and take advantage of all these dimensions or go into like like a close range i mean i mean not a, it's a minor spoiler for book four that I'm writing right now, but I decided to do something that I was worried about for a while, not being realistic enough or not realistic enough. There's going to be a ship, a capital ship, that uh, has giant blades in the bottom that cuts another ship in half, almost. And like, at this point, I want to do stuff that's really cool and really fun. And you can make you, you can make anything sound plausible enough in the story that you're writing, in the setting that you're creating, if you do it well, and if it's believable in, in what what happens in the events of the story. So, I think 
think Brandon Sanderson called that the rule of cool. Like, if a thing is cool, better off including it, then you can figure out how to make it make sense with your world afterward or as you write. You don't have to work. I don't worry about real science. I mean, again, like, some of it does come in. Like, I do have actually, I think there's an article recently about brain implants that could, like, you could put memories on or steal memories from. So I was a plot point in book one where a character has a brain implant to hide memories in from somebody who could read his mind. So like you always have these, these things that whether intentional or not, they have some tie into real technology. A lot of it doesn't because that's not the focus of the story. The focus is uh, the, the plot, the, the adventure, the characters, the conflicts and um, stuff like that. Now, um, one of the things that is uh, really, really interesting about that is uh, all the effects on, at least I find it interesting. I find it fascinating. I mean, you were talking about you could do something and as long as it's cool and then you'll figure out how it works later. One of the other things that happens, especially with TV shows and movies, which simply don't have the time or space to develop um, their artificial, you know, their false technology in any detail, uh, Whereas books are expected and almost demanded to have more detail. One of the fascinating things about that is that the audience will come along later and explain it for you. And you'll oh, yeah. have like physicists coming out and they made up and they'll say, well, if you look at this and you look at that and you take those together and sure, it requires an unbelievably immense amount of energy, but this is physically possible. And you're sitting there smacking your forehead going, wow, <laughs> I did not know that. Yeah, there are entire books for like for Star Trek at least. There's entire books on how that stuff could work, and like those are popular books. Like, like I mean, I even I, I do occasionally think about. It. I actually, when I was creating for this book, um, a certain type of power similar to how the is analogous to the Force in Star Wars. It's not doesn't work the same way, but it's similar in some ways. Part of the, my thinking of how it works or how people interact with the world using it is through quantum physics a little bit about how. Everything is constantly in motion. Everything could be different states at different times. And that's how this power could be used to impact things. Like it could be used to all of a sudden like flash freeze like the uh, water on the floor so that someone could just slip and fall on it when they're trying to attack you. Or how to like make energy or how to make something like temporarily um, become a different state of matter or a different state of, of uh, strength. And then, and then but the, on the other hand, it also wants to go back to its regular state is one of the things where it's hard to maintain these little changes that these characters from who can use this power could do. But uh, like I do, I did draw a little bit on that kind of concept, at least in a very vague uh, sense of it. And again, it was number one, it was going to be something cool. Then I had to try to think about how it would make a little bit of sense. Because obviously in the universe, they're going to try to explain how it works to a degree, whether or not they know it, they actually know or not. I guess like another quote that I've heard, I forget where I heard it, where it's from originally from, where like, any technology advanced enough is basically magic at some point. And the same goes with magic. You feel like you could have characters who try to explain how magic works through technology terms. I mean, Star Wars did it clumsily with the midichlorians, but they you tried to do it at some point. And it isn't necessarily inherently bad. It depends how you do it. Even the Thor movie and the Doctor Strange movie tried to do that. Um, but yeah. uh, one of the other things I find is fascinating, the people who do... And I, I mean, I literally find this fascinating as in I've, I've watched these videos, several of them, and I'm always, uh, you know, eager to to watch more. They will take a fictional battle um, in a uh, in a science fiction universe, let's say Wolf 359, the, the big uh -huh. infamous battle in the Star Trek where a Borg cube destroyed most of Starfleet or a large chunk of Starfleet. Um, and they will analyze the tactics and analyze the ships that are available and show how the tactics made sense or, or uh, uh, how the tactics could have been done better to, um, to make the battle more to where the characters could have taken better advantage of the technology that they are said to have. Um, and again, uh, going back to the... Uh, I mean, someone did the same thing for, you know, obviously, the infamous scene we've already talked about in The Last Jedi, pointing out that, well, if you had this big ship uh, with shields and you had all these little ships, instead of driving it into the uh, super, you know, Death Star or super uh, Star Destroyer, why don't you just move it so that your shields, your ship, 
is between the little shuttles and the enemy, so they're shooting into the back of you, and yeah. it's going fine, and everybody's safe. Um, that's a really obvious kind of question, but a, a deeper one was somebody took um, in the new Battlestar Galactica series, and I know that's kind of odd to say new when it started, like, what, 14 years ago, 15 years ago? In the new Battlestar Galactica series, they had a moment at which a highly, highly advanced Battlestar had joined the fleet, and because of some machinations by the writers, that Battlestar um, was apparently destroyed in saving the Galactica and the rest of the fleet. I saw a video of someone analyzing the capabilities of the Cylon base stars and the capabilities of the Galactica uh, and the, the Pegasus, and showing how they could have made a battle plan to maximize the use of weapons on the Galactica and the Pegasus that could have uh, enabled them to save the Pegasus instead of it being destroyed. I find that kind of stuff fascinating. And yeah. let me bring that back to a question about the book. Um, when you're planning battles, do you ever go back and think, or, or before time, do you ever think about, okay, does this make sense with the characters I've made? Does this make sense with the technology I've made? If I were, for example, wargaming this, how would the battle itself as a whole go? Or do you focus on on the story or a little bit of both? No, I absolutely definitely do both. I definitely like to wargame to a degree. It's obviously hard when I'm having battles of the scale that I'm having because it's like you can't micromanage every single ship out of thousands or hundreds that I'm having in the battle. But I definitely try. As I said before, I always try to think about what they're attacking, what's going on here, what weapons they have, uh, what would work better. Like I have, actually, I think it was in this book, book three, where I have a character divide, they, 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 um, comes up with a new ta new tactic to use against an enemy who's very, very good at reading their tactics and figuring out what they're going to do next and a way to kind of take advantage of being spontaneous, more or less, in order to keep it from being able to predict what they're going to do. So I always like to try and think about I Actually, I do watch those channels a lot also. Like I've, in the last few months... Maybe even longer. I've been watching uh, Space Stock and I mean, Eckhart's Ladder does a lot of that. All of that also on YouTube. There's some other, might be one or two others also that do that. But those are all very fascinating to me. They, I like to watch this stuff, and it definitely has like I don't necessarily go watch them before I write my battles, but I definitely like to um, look at that and like, look at what ships that I have. It's especially easier now that I'm starting to write down for a lore reason. I'm actually going to post after this podcast. I'm going to make my first lore post about a ship in the universe but i'm writing now like, some of the ship classes about what their what the capabilities are more had have it more hard written down because the problem you often see with franchises like star wars or star trek especially they've gone on for so long with so many creators who were involved that the rules of what the ships could do is keeps changing and they contradict each other yet so you don't really even know when you're doing these battles simulations on like the versus things on youtube which version to use because there are some versions that are ludicrously powerful and some that are far less powerful and uh, and that impacts everything. But I like I do like to try and think about like where I have, what, what ships I have on this side, especially if it's, again, the smaller battle, it's very easy to do because you could just literally figure out where each ship is. But even for the big ones, I could say like, what does this fleet have? What does this fleet do best? Like this one fleet, their ships are designed to be fast they're designed to be like in your face they're designed to to keep moving in the battle they're not not just slug it out with like other capital ships they're designed to keep moving and shooting at the same time whereas the other ships might be more they're designed to be more static and just like uh taking whatever hits they get and dealing back even more and um yeah anyways, i mean that, that's something i do, I do enjoy a lot I, like my space battles my, my favorite my favorite thing out of all science fiction that i watched like, ever so I thought like, the best parts of all of these movies I could watch all like over and over again, at least if they're done well, are the space battles. So that's one of the things I really like to have in my books. Like, and I do try. I mean, obviously, again, it's hard with uh, size, scale of battles that I often have in the books, but it is a lot of fun to just sit down for a few, like, for a couple of minutes, think about what who is attacking where, what if there's any space stations involved, any static defenses involved. I, I actually just wrote a chapter. In book four of like a big battle at a planet where one side prepared much better in advance than the other side and took full advantage of sack defenses of hidden ships behind the moon or something or i think it was thing was behind the moon or ships or ships just waiting out out of the system in hyperspace to come back in behind the other fleet that was just attacking their fleet and things like that and it's like i think it really adds it does add something to like the realism and also just to the fun 
like, like I said, I do really enjoy those videos from Star Wars and Star Trek is analyzing the battles, and it's just it's fascinating. Um, I would really like to talk about this some more, but we are bumping up against the end of yeah. the time, and I've got a, I've got things to do immediately after the show. Uh, but I want to thank you for coming on, and also give you a yeah. last second to pitch anything you want to uh, before we roll out. Oh, well, aside from just uh, obvious, the Galaxy Sentence series book three, the Shifting Alliance Indiegogo is live now. Um, at, at, with every with every tier you back from five dollars and up, you get two free eBooks from of the first two books in the series. And those people who are who, whoever wanted to be uh, to put themselves inside a, a space rebellion or a space empire or something in between, uh, there are multiple tiers where you get to have a character with the name based off you or somebody you like or somebody you hate uh, put into the book as a secondary character with the name. And different levels. One level is just an appearance guarantee. Another one is an appearance plus meaning meaning one of the main characters at least once. And also, I have a glorious death tier, which you could use again for yourself or for anybody you don't like. You want to put a name in there. Nice. Obviously, names obviously names subject to change and I, to add to adaptation based on the species that they're involved with. But like I said, I have over a dozen species, and I have at least like three main factions right now. Like, you know, more at least three main factions right now that are involved where I could. Work with, work with you to put a character in a place that makes the most sense. That would be the most interesting for you and for the story itself. And like I said, there's a ton of characters already who I even like I gotta say I guarantee one appearance. But besides secondary characters often come back if they survive. So there's a chance that this character will come back more. So uh, for anybody who is inclined to whoever wanted that for themselves, it's an option, and uh, it'd be a lot of fun for me too to get to include some. Uh, Kind of real people in there. All right. Uh, do you have anything else to uh, say before we kick off? Uh, yeah, Yakov, Merck, and thank you so much for joining us again. Uh, it was a pleasure having you on, and I look forward to hearing about your future success in space battles. I did have one yeah. minor question. Talking about all those space battles, when's the RPG coming out? Oh, I mean, I would need another uh, crowdfunding campaign for that. I think. <laughs> Let's do it. And, Let's do it. And, and, some, and somebody who knows RPGs better than I do who could help uh, figure out how to, how to make it work right. Because, again, I do have multiple, multiple different fleets and multiple different types of ships that would work very well for that, I think. It would be a lot of fun with different um, capabilities and things like that. But I, it's not something that I'm knowledgeable on as far as making a game. So I would really need somebody to work with me on that to figure out how it would be set up in a type of game or how that would work. But... If, if, if it goes well, if, if the series keeps doing well, and doing, I mean, every book is done better than the last book, then I, I would definitely plan for that in the future at some point, because that would be a lot of fun uh, for me, too. Even if I don't play the game so much, I would love to play my own game. So, Cool. Thanks, man. All right. I want to say thanks to uh, Yaka for coming on the show. Um, wish him best of luck with his uh, Indiegogo. Uh, I backed it. I uh, put the link to the Indiegogo and a link to his Amazon page in the description of the video. Uh, description below the video and if you're getting this through uh um like soundcloud or wherever you should have it also in the uh information uh on the video so you should be able to see that and go there um i want to thank uh everybody who's coming to the uh chat listen to us live they're talking about um a lot of stuff doing do with blizzard and uh thrawn and things like that um the battle of the bastards from uh George R. R. Martin, the George R. R. Martin based TV series came up talking about tactics there. So uh, go check it out. Tom Kratman um, recently had a post go up on the Bayon Books website. So if you go look at the Bayon Books website, uh, or not the website, the Bayon Books Twitter account or Tom Kratman's Twitter or Facebook accounts, you can find a link to that. Um, and he talks about uh, battlefield organization and tactics and things like that. I thought it was absolutely fascinating and I thought it was absolutely gold. If you are a, he's specifically talking about how it works for his science fiction universe, but he brings in a bunch of examples uh, from history and how things have worked with history, how organization works, uh, things like that. So that you can just, you don't have to go all in and, you know, ram a whole course on military history down the throats of your readers but you can be informed 
by military history and by how uh, Colonel Kratman does it. Again, reminder, he was in the infantry uh, for many, 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 many years. He's a professional war fighter. And even though he's retired now, he still uh, retains a huge amount of knowledge about that subject. Give the article a read. It's not a super long article, but I found it very, very informative. And it's a good way to kind of give yourself some added verisimilitude when you're discussing military issues uh, in a fictional universe like science fiction, fantasy, whatever you've created, steampunk, whatever. All right. So thanks, everybody, for coming on. Thanks, Yaka, for coming on. Uh, this is Geek Gab. We are here about every uh, Saturday about this time next week. We are scheduled to have someone come on the show who uh, worked on the multiplayer of the original Halo series. And so uh, we're looking forward to that very much. And so uh, you can get this show on soundcloud.com. Just do a search for Geek Gab. You can get this show on the Google Play Store or the iTunes Store. Just do a search for Geek Gab and subscribe there. And of course, we are available on YouTube at geekgab, youtube.com slash geekgab, and you can uh, check out the shows and even read through the live chat. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in. We are leaving you for today, but don't you worry. Don't you fret. We will be back.